All right. Um, turn with me to Luke chapter 8, verse 40. Luke chapter 8, verse 40. I have preached from this um, many times with one particular slant. And this morning I want to talk a little bit from uh, 2 Corinthians 5, just a little bit from there. You know, I just want to make this uh, kind of a pointed sermon as we head into communion. Um, and I want to talk this morning about uh, goals. Luke chapter 8, verse 40. I want to talk about goals. And how we are not called to just live a meandering, nebulous, uh, make no decisions type life. We are called to, you know, really to have a plan. God has put a plan in motion. God has a plan. God did not send Jesus and just say, see what happens. Why don't you just go live amongst them, have some conversations, do, you know, react to, respond and react to what's going on. There's a plan in place. Sometimes we read the story of Jesus and we think it's just kind of like, oh, runs into this person, eh, something, happens. something happens. Like it's just all a meandering journey. And sometimes we think, and, and I even hear young adults honestly talk about it this way, that, you know, it's really just a pilgrimage and a journey and there's really no destination and there's really no uh, hard things, tr solid truths, that settled matters. It's just conversational. You know, it's a narrative that you know, live out your narrative in this world. There's, there's a lot of catchphrases that are used. And I'm not saying they're bad in, if they're used right, but they're bad if they're used wrong. I will say that. If settle, I'm going to talk this morning for a few minutes about settling some matters in your heart, in your life, in your marriage, in your friendships, in your relationships. Settling them, setting some goals. This is not unscriptural. Set it, having a vision. And taking steps, Holy Spirit-filled, Bible-centered steps, cross-centered steps to those, to accomplish those, to allow God to accomplish those in your life. This is not just a meandering journey. Uh, Luke chapter 8, verse 40. Since Jesus, um, in Luke 7, 40. Now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. No one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me, Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Just believe and she will be healed. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She is not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, My child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but he had ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. Father, I pray for this time. I pray that we open how we open the word, Lord, how we uh, discuss the word, how we preach the word, Lord, how we hear your word. I pray, Lord, uh, for hearts in here this morning, that uh, lines will be drawn in the sand, Lord, that lives will be changed, that hearts will be turned towards you by your Holy Spirit, that the cross will be lifted high. We pray this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Um, this past Christmas season, one of the things that our family did uh, was a bunch, a couple families took some of their old VHSs and put them onto DVDs. Now, when, when I was a young man in my 20s, I was the only one of my siblings that was around me that was not married with kids. I got married kind of later in life. I got married in my 30s. And um, I, I was kind of like the bachelor guy. So I, you know, good uncle, fun uncle, I thought until, listen to what happened. So I bought a big, you know, the cameras that, you know, it's not like right now, it's like, get out your phone and film it in HD. It was like, 
get something huge that costs like 10 times as much as the phone costs. And, and so I, I videotaped a lot of old VHS and I videotaped parties. I was the, uh, I guess, I don't know, I was the documentarian, if that's even a word, of, of, of growing up. We got, you know, nieces and nephews, all their, you know, their, their births, their, their parties and stuff like that. And so we had tons of those videos. And someone, you know, um, nicely uh, put them, a bunch of them on DVD. So we spent some time watching them on DVD. Now, I'm not in them. It's only my voice, okay? Much, once in a while, I would put it down and I would sit and I would say a few things and then I would have to turn it back, right? I can't not be documented at all. Um, and so we're watching them and I'm listening. And you know how sometimes when you are listening or you see yourself, you're like, ah, oh, I look like that. Really, you know what I mean? Uh, I was listening, I'm going, this is, this is no lie. I'm like, I'm, pardon what I'm about to say, but I'm a jerk. I, I could not get over. It re honestly, it's, you know, I'm kind of being funny about it, but it wasn't funny to me. Everybody's laughing, watching the videos. Oh, look at cute Emma, you know, look at her dancing. Look at Johnny and Ben, you know. And I'm just listening going, oh, I'm like mean. I'm like, you know, get, move on, I'm trying to get this picture. Get out of the way. I'm like, I'm, I was kind of cut to, you know, like, I don't want to be a jerk. And I'm listening to them. I'm listening to the videos, and everybody's laughing and having a good time. And I'm like, you know what? 2015, I'm going to set a specific goal. And you know, my family's going to laugh at this. I'm not going to be a jerk. <laughs> Bobby just clapped. <laughs> Um, and you know what? Here's my, here's my point, though. I made a few others, and I'll tell you them in a second. Uh, you know, declarations or resolutions, whatever you want to call them. But I, I realized as I was saying this that I said, you know what? I just can't say that. I have to put a plan into place. You just can't make a resolution and say, oh, this is going to be different in my life. This is going to be different with my, uh, in my marriage, with my wife, with my kids. This is going to be different at work. This is going to be different with my friends. You just can't say that and just expect it to happen. I've learned that plans have to actually be put into place. You actually have to say, okay, to accomplish this, I've got to do the following. First, I have to have the vision of what I want to accomplish. Second, I have to have an action plan how I'm going to do this. Third, I have to do it. And fourth, I have to assess, I have to stop every once in a while and assess and see how it's going. That's, that's a typical four step process for anything at work, accomplishing anything. You know, we're, we're living in a day and age of education where two things are going out the window that are very helpful for kids with this. Uh, I teach geometry. They don't do proofs anymore. Do you guys remember proofs? Here's a theorem, you've got to prove it. You can use postulates, definitions, whatever. But you've got to go from here to here, and you've got to write the two-column proof. Anyone know what I'm talking about? I still teach it in my geometry class. The kids go, oh, why do you still teach this in geometry? Why do you still teach this? Uh, my, kid, my friend over at whatever school, they don't do They say the teacher says we don't do proofs anymore in geometry because no, none of the new books do. I say because the process is huge. It's the process. The other thing they don't do is diagramming sentences. Do they still teach diagramming sentences? You know, we have to break down the predicate and the thing that comes after the predicate and the things that explain, you know, and all that stuff. And you have to... Those two things, proofs and diagramming sentences, I think are really helpful beyond math and English because what they do is they force you to break apart something, see, you know, see how it gets from A to B to C to D to E and, and, and explain each step as you go and, and, and see how it all works together and justify it and verify it and... And, and not just say, oh, this is what a sentence is. Oh, this is, how, this is what a theorem is. You know, I, I think about that, and I think about my life, and I'm thinking, I live a lot of my life like, oh, just, just will happen. I, I don't want to be a jerk. Well, let's just not be a jerk anymore. No, I think I have to say, well, what are some steps? And I've got some le concrete, legitimate steps to help me with this. Right? Some of you guys are involved in this. You're going to have to hold me accountable. Every time I'm a jerk, just raise your hand so you're being a jerk. All right? You know, a, a couple other things. I was driving down the road, and a car in front of me swerved. I don't know. The guy must have been on his cell phone or whatever, because all of a sudden, it almost went off the highway at like 60 miles an hour, at exactly 55 miles an hour. This car almost went off the highway. I'm like, what if that thing just rolled into the median? Oh, what if I stopped? And what if I got out? And what if I lifted the car and he was stuck? 
Oh, my mind just started going like this. Like, wouldn't that be awesome? Like, they write an article about me. What if they, and, what if, and what if someone was videotaping behind and they got it on videotape? And I was, they saw me throw the car off the guy, and then the car burst into his flame. It's, it was very dramatic. I was just driving down the road thinking, <laughs> thinking all that. And then all of a sudden, God, you know, I started thinking, what do you just want to be like a hero? Do you want like a super moment? And I started thinking, yes, I kind of do. I kind of want a moment where everybody says, well, look at him. And I was really struck by God, again, something I preach to a lot of, live it out in the mundane in 2015. Be, you know, I've talked about this a lot, but I'm going to keep saying it. Don't worry about superhero moments. Worry about non-superhero moments. Worry about getting up and doing the right thing in a conversation, in a mundane, stupid, boring moment at work or just in the home where nothing tremendous is going. Worrying about, you know, you know, pray hard into being really holy in the mundane moments. Because, you know, my mind can go into the superhero moments all the time. I don't know what it is. Well, who doesn't want to be a superhero, right? An another one was, um, we were watching some of the videos, and one of them was uh, where, you know, people were, we were away somewhere, I guess, and there was a lot of landscape panning the landscape. I was like, who cares now? Stop on a person. I want to see what they looked like back then. You know, have you ever looked through someone's pictures and they show you a vacation they went on and you're flipping through them and there's all these like birds and trees and mountains and sunsets and you're like, mm -hmm. oh, a person. Oh, look at this. Look what they looked like back then. Oh, who's that? And, and I was thinking about that. I had too much time this week. I was recovering from a sickness. And I was thinking about that, and I'm thinking, you know what, really, the only thing that, I said this before too, the only thing that really matters that people really ultimately care about is people. The only thing that matters is people. And so I'm taking these three things, and I've got a lot of other little personal ones that I, you know, I'm not going to share, that things I want to accomplish, and say, you know what, I need to get some things straight in my life. I need to get, I need to not be a jerk. I need to not have a video display that. I need to not be always just looking for a big moment and never appreciating and, and, and engaging and bringing up God into little mundane moments of my life. I need to stop chasing after stuff and even mentally and, and say, you know, what really matters is this person and this relationship I have with this person and how I treat this person because people are really all that matters. And I need to get right with those three things. And, and I'm going to do a point here. And to do those goals that I have, I need to actually establish a process. I need to settle some things. I need to get some things straight. This can't just be a meandering journey. I had to, we, had, we read Acts 8, 40. There was a reason that we read it. I love Acts 8, 40 for the story. It's one of my favorite stories of Jesus. Because Jesus is a man on a mission. He's been told that he's got to, uh, not got to, but please raise this girl from the dead. My daughter is dying. And so he's got that goal. He's heading to that door. And as he's going to that door, this woman, this, this woman that's, that's embarrassed at the sickness, that's Jairus is the synagogue ruler. She's probably been shunned from the synagogue because of her sickness. He's going to raise the synagogue ruler's daughter. And here's someone who's been probably oppressed, not oppressed, but you know what I mean, denied by the synagogue ruler. And she reaches through the crowd and she just wants to, she just wants to be healed. And so you, you know the story. I read it. But as he's going to this incredible point, right? This is, this is a sermon I usually preach on this, and I like this thought. He's not so keyed on that that he doesn't see this right here, right? That, you know, he, he, his eyes are open, that there is any pot to our life. That it's not just, I've got to accomplish this, I've got to accomplish this, I've got to accomplish this, I've got to get this degree, and I don't care who gets in my way, I've got to get this house, and I don't care who gets in my way. That there is a journey part where our eyes have to be open to the left and the right, and then when these people are reaching out, we have to stop, as Jesus did, and said, you know, what's going on? And the disciples are like, well, what are you talking about what's going on? Everything's going on. Everybody's touching you, everybody's yelling for you. No, no, no. Someone really reached out for me. Someone like patted me on the back. Someone actually reached out for me. And so he stops and he deals with this woman. And that's usually a sermon I preach, and it's, and it, I'm going to say it's a good sermon, but it's a good thought for that, look, we, we've got to have our eyes to, you know, not just on the prize, we've got to have them and be open to people on the side. However, let me say this, he still continued on his way, and he still went to that house. This is this part of the sermon. I've never really talked about this part of the sermon, this passage. 
He, he, had, he had a place he was heading. Again, let me say what I said at the beginning. Jesus did not just come and say, well, let's see what happens. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians 5. Jesus came. Jesus came to save you. 2 Corinthians 5, this beautiful passage. It wasn't just a meandering journey through this world. Just figuring out, I'll heal this person. I'll, if this person talks to me, I'll talk to them. And see what happens. Oh, they're mad? They're going to kill me? Oh, gee. Didn't see that coming. You know? This was a specific event that God created in time. Since before time, it says. He was the lamb chosen before time. In Revelation, it says that. And he had a specific goal. And he himself, in Luke 19, says that his goal was to come and to seek and to save that which was lost. And that which was lost was me. And that which was lost was you. And then he has entrusted us to do the same. It says, we'll talk more about this next week, but he's called us to be ambassadors of the very same message of reconciliation. And I'm going to challenge you this morning. I'm going to use a little bit of Col uh, 2 Corinthians 5, a little bit of Colossians 2. And I'm just really going to challenge you to put a stake in the ground and make a decision and quit this let's see what happens type stuff. I entitled the sermon to be or to not be. You know, kind of a play on to be or, to, or not to be from Hamlet. To be or to not be. See, a nonconformist is praised in this world. Oh, we don't conform to that. But if you think about what a nonconformist is, it's someone who just doesn't do what someone else is doing. Not actually being, they're not being. Does that make any sense? See, a lot of people reject Christianity. They just say, I don't want to be that. But what are you being? Right? You're just rejecting something. A nonconformist simply rejects. They just aren't something. And I don't want to live a life like that. Uh, to be or just to not be. I don't want to just be someone who reacts to things and rejects things. And I think some of uh, you guys are just rejecting things. Instead of saying, well, what are you? What to be or to not be? Well, I want to be. That's what this whole sermon series is about. I want to be. I want to be useful. I want to be productive. I want, I, when I go, as it says in 2 Corinthians 5, we talked about this last week, before the beam, before the judgment seat of Christ, I want, to, I want Jesus to say, well done, good and faithful servant. I want to, you know, I, I believe, I know I'm saved. I know I'm his. That's a settled matter. But I have unsettled matters still in my walk on a daily basis. I just gave you a few of things I want to accomplish. And my point this morning is to not going to happen just by saying, gee, I hope this happens. Gee, I hope I can bring holiness into the mundane. Gee, I hope I can not be a jerk anymore. Gee, I hope I can put people first. Gee, I hope I can fix this relationship that I have. I hope it just fixes itself. You know, again, I'm a big believer in the movie journey. I'll be looking at, you know, the, the woman reaching out and this happening and that we're not supposed to be zeroed in on these, that we forget this stuff. I hope you, get, you understand. I've preached that a million times. But, not, but also, uh, there are things that you have to say, I believe, settled this. And I believe there's a sense of unsettled lack of peace in some of you because you haven't settled some matters. That they're still just kind of sitting there and you go, well, well I hope it works out. Well, I, ho I hope I can fix this problem in my life. Well, I hope I can fix this relationship in my life. Well, I hope, gee, if I just you know, keep moving, something will happen. No, you have to uh, directly attack some things. I really believe that. You have to settle some matters. 2 Corinthians 5 says something very important. And I want to be honest, I'm not 100% in love with my new Bible's way of saying it. It's 2 Corinthians 5.17. My Bible says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. I like if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. This is not something that's just a new mindset, a new teaching. This is a new, you are a, if you are in Christ... You are a new creation. These things that you want to have happen, they can happen not because you suddenly uh, have a goal, but because you are a new creation in Christ. And you've got to settle some matters. Turn with me to Colossians 2. You've got to settle. This in way, because I want you guys to have peace. Colossians 2, 13 through 15 has three finished matters. Settled matters. 
And I'm just going to really hit this as we go to communion. Because this is what it's all about. And everything in Colossians 2, 13 through 15 is accomplished because of the cross. This past week I was up in Maine. And uh, we decided to go on a hike. Now there's not a lot of snow up there. You'd think there would be, but there wasn't a lot of snow. It was a long hike. It was more like a walk, but it was, I'll call it a hike. I thought it was just going to be a walk. So I wore lousy shoes. I thought we were just kind of going through the woods. And, but there was a lot of ice patches all the way through. A lot of it was ice. And my shoes were, couldn't handle it. And let me tell you something. It feels worse than unsolid footing. Do you know what I mean by that? Where every step is like, right? Where's, and then you'd look for like leaves that you could just walk on or, or snow. So I was looking for like the side where there was a little bit of snow that I could walk on. Well, I, let me, the age old question, if a tree falls in the woods <laughs> and no one's there, does it make a sound? Uh, yes, and the sound is, ah, fun. Okay, my feet, uh, went out from under me, and, and Dagley's are built thick. This is one of the few times that it's actually helpful. We're thick, from head to toe, thick heads, thick torsos. So I, I don't like try to ever break my fall. I just let my, you know, I've fallen before. My feet went out, and I went, I just said, okay, I'm going down. I'm, like, I'm out, nothing. And I hit, I hit hard. My, my back is, my shoulder, I don't, I hit hard. And, and then I was only halfway through this walk. But it was, the rest of the walk was like this. There is nothing more disconcerting to me than not having solid footing, solid ground to walk on. You can't move. Everything's a baby step. Everything's a baby step. Everything, you're looking down, you're just doing this. There's no strides. There's no moving. They say of all the uh, natural, natural disasters, the worst one that the, the most disconcerting one is the earthquake, when you feel like you can't even trust what's underneath you. I'm not saying any of them are good, but they say the worst one that, that people really feel the, the, the most shaken is by an earthquake because you can't trust what's underneath you. I'm saying this for a reason, so we head to Colossians 2. I really want to challenge you. Get your footing solid. Settle some, money. Settle some matters this year. Colossians 2, 13 through 15 has three settled matters that I would like you to settle as we head to communion. Because all three of them are settled by the cross. 1 Kings 18 says, Elijah drew a line in the sand and said, if God is God, follow him. If he's not, don't. But don't think you can traverse this line. Don't think you can straddle this line. Either God is God or he's not. Well, we know he is, obviously. God is God or he's not, but you have to be on one side or the other. Settle the matter, Elijah said. Joshua 24, 15. You probably all have it in your house. You can serve this God or that God. As for me and my house, we are serving the one true God. You can't straddle this. You have to settle that matter. Colossians 2 says... When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. This is the first thing. You were dead. These are all written in the finished, whatever Greek, whatever that is. These are all accomplished, finished acts in Christ. You were dead in sin. Christ made you alive. You didn't blow air into yourself. You didn't blow life into yourself. Christ made you alive. Christ initiates everything. He's you don't initiate anything. You don't initiate your faith. It's God initiated. When you were dead in your sins, fact, Christ made you alive. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. You are forgiven. That's... that's uh, a, a Greek word that I've done some studying on. I'm not a Greek scholar, but I, this one really fascinated me. And the Greek word there is, is things that you have, an IOU you have written against yourself. You owe someone something and you know it. And this verse says, God has taken that and through Christ nailed that to the cross and canceled it. Only in him has it been canceled. And canceled it. You need to settle, of all the three matters in this verse, I would say, this is one of the most important for some of you right now. You need to know that you're forgiven. 
You need to know that that charge that you even get, and you've written it out against yourself, has been canceled in Christ. He took that upon himself. 2 Corinthians 5.21, like I said, he became sin. He who knew no sin became sin. And he took that, and you've got to settle that. You've got to believe that. That's unsolid footing for some of you. It's, it can be unsolid footing for me, because I, and I, I whirl them back around in my head. These are finished acts, settled matters in this verse. There's three of them. The first one is you were dead in your sin. Christ made you alive. The light bulb went on. I get this. I don't know why. Well, yes, because Christ opened my eyes. I get this. The Holy Spirit opened my eyes. I was dead, and now I see. Well, what, what, what do I see? I see my, my sin. I see it's written against me in my own hands. I've done this. He hasn't done this. I've done it. And God said, I take that, and, and on the cross, I nail it to the cross, and it's cancer. Do you really believe that? Is that matter settled? Uh, you have to believe that. You, have, you can't move on until you believe that. I'm, I'm not kidding you. Me and me. And then every once in a while, whoop, boom. And you're like, what just happened? Well, you're not on solid footing. It's questioning every step. The third one for me is the most important right now. And it says this. Verse 15, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross. And you know those things that oppress you and mock you? He has defeated them. He has triumphed over them. Finish that. They have no power over you. Whatever you think has power you, you're wrong. Whatever you think hasn't been forgiven, you're wrong. These are finished acts in Jesus Christ. Finished in the cross. Finished. Settled matters. That's what the sermon is. I have things <clears throat> that I want to accomplish. I have things that I want. I, I don't want to be a jerk. I don't want to be wrapped up in stuff. I want to be wrapped up in people. Right? <clears throat> I don't want to be wrapped up in just trying to do something great. I want to be okay with bringing holy into the very mundane winter months and all this kind of stuff and getting up and, <clears throat> you know, having normal conversations that matter. I, wanna, I want this kind of stuff, but it's just not going to happen. I have to settle some matters first. I have to set a plan in motion. I have to get in his word. I have to believe. Everything changes when you believe, when you really believe. Amen. Everything changes. <clears throat> and so I'm pleading with you as we go to communion, as we go to communion, I want you to think about what was finished at the cross. He opened your eyes. You were dead. He breathed life into you. You had a written code against yourself. And, it, and you know it. Once your eyes are open, you know it. If your eyes aren't open, you don't know what you're doing wrong. But once your eyes are open, you know it. And he says, I've nailed that to the cross. I've canceled that. It's over. And then, and then the third one is, those things that harass me, those, those powers that, that keep beating me, I've triumphed over them. I've triumphed over them, he says, at the cross. I've revealed them for what they are. I've made a spectacle of those things that you think can defeat you. I've made a spectacle of them. Publicly shown them for what they are. They can't beat you. You can let them beat you, but in the cross, in the spirit, they won't beat you. Do you, do you settle these matters? Please, in closing, 2 Corinthians 6.2. It's one verse. I would like the deacons to prepare to get ready as I read it. 2 Corinthians 6.2. I'm challenging you with this. For, the, for he says, the time of my favor I, In the time of my favor I heard you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Now, this moment. If you're sitting here going, I've heard all this, I've heard the Spirit working. Now. Guys, put that stake in the ground now. Settle the matter now. Say no more now. Say I will not treat this person anymore this way now. Say I will not get involved in that anymore now. Salvation is the day you're saved into heaven, but it's also continual salvations of who you are in the meantime. You can have progressive salvations as you go through the day, as you go through the year, as you go through your life. And I pray that today is a day of the salvation for something that you might be going through. I'd like to ask if the uh, deacons could come forward.
It's good to have goals. It's good to have concrete goals that you want to accomplish. Write them down. Jesus had a concrete goal. Concrete. He loves you so much. He loves you so much. You were his goal. Even the healings were all with one thing in mind. Hey, if you don't believe who I am on account of what I say, at least believe on the healings. The healings were part of the goal to bring people to faith, to get them to believe. Everything was geared towards that goal to save you. To save you. He loves you so much. That's what the gospel is. The incredible love of Jesus for you. The incredible love of God for you. Not his hatred towards you. His love towards you. That he would come and suffer, break his body, shed his blood. This was all for that one thing that he was, he was uh, man, he was zeroed in. He was zeroed in on one thing, and that one thing was you. I can't tell you how much that means to me. It gets me through days. His love for me. His love for me. His love for you. I hope you, I hope you feel that. I hope you experience that this morning. Father, we thank you for that amazing grace. I pray, Lord, even if there's just one soul in here, that finally their eyes have been opened by you, Lord, that their sins can be forgiven through Jesus, that there can be peace in their hearts, Lord, peace in their future. I pray that that will happen, Lord, that you will do a mighty, amazing work. Salvation is an amazing work. Generated by you, you are the author of it, Lord. I pray that you author salvation in this room this morning in so many different ways. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Amen.